Well, welcome to our listeners uh, for today's Domestic Violence Hub podcast. I have with us Angela Lynch from the Women's Legal Service in Queensland. Hello, Angela. Hi, Dominique. <laughs> it's lovely to have you. Um, we have been familiar with your work at Women's Legal Service for many years. How did you come to work at the Women's Legal Service? Well, um, like a lot of people, I answered an ad a long, long time ago now, and um, I went through an interview process and got the job. I had was already a volunteer at the service at the time, so I knew that the of the work that they were doing. So um, yeah, I thought, why not um, give this. Um, a go rather than um, being in private practice. And it really, um, I think, once I actually started working there and opened my eyes up in relation to the number of barriers and the issues that women in domestic violence faced, um, it really was um, such a positive um, experience. And I've stayed there ever since in relation to my career. I've been there 25 years now, so it's a long time. It's an incredibly long time, particularly with very difficult work, I think. Um, What do you think keeps people coming back to the women's legal service, not just clients, but obviously employees? I think that its role in advocacy and bringing about change so that um, involvement in systemic change and law reform is really positive and has a positive impact on our um, employees. So I think that if you were doing that hard work day in, day out, without actually thinking, I have to bring about a positive change here, I have to try to make the system better, it could um, have a quite a negative impact actually on, on employees because the work is hard, the cases are difficult and they're really challenging. So to have that outlet of positivity, of trying to bring about change and seeking social justice is a really important aspect of, of keeping our employees Um, happy at work. It's been, um, I think, for many of our members and and the businesses that um, have been involved, you know, with your service or, you know, with this kind of work, what's becoming more and more clear is just how complex domestic and family violence is. I mean, how do you describe domestic and family violence and explain what you do, you know, when you speak, you know, around the state about what the Women's Legal Service is doing? I think it's what what's important for people to understand, um, many people understand the different aspects of violence, so that it's not just physical violence, that it's um, economic and financial violence, that it's psychological, um, sexual, uh, verbal, and that it's a pattern of abuse. So it's not a one-off incident um, and there's power and control involved. So usually there is a person who has more power um, in the relationship and utilises that for their own end and utilises their um, activities for um, their own means um, to get and can, to sustain power and control over another person. So, yeah, I think that, and that's what the legal system has a lot of difficulty in, in really understanding that it is a pattern of abuse rather than just these one-off incidents. So that's why people also talk about domestic violence as being coercive and controlling violence because it kind of indicates it's it's much more than physical acts of abuse and can be ongoing and usually is. I think that, you know, that's so important, particularly for our employers that are trying to help, you know, people that make disclosures in the workplace because often they think, once a person's, you know, come forward and said, look, this is what I'm experiencing, I'm going to leave, that that's kind of the end of it. And they don't understand that it can be such a journey, you know, to finally leave or or to remove yourself from um, a situation. I mean, what are some of the complexities, you know, around somebody simply making a decision to leave? It's well established through um, research, our practice knowledge, the domestic violence and family violence death review boards that exist throughout Australia and internationally that the most dangerous time for women and children leaving domestic violence and the most high risk time is at and around separation and that's proved over and over again. And usually the woman at some level has an understanding of the level of danger that she is in, even if she cannot vocalise that herself, innately she can understand that. There are high levels of fear around 
what could happen to her and her children if she actually does leave in these highly dangerous and highly coercive controlling relationships. So if a woman is presenting to an employer with high levels of fear, that really needs to be taken seriously because a woman's innate knowledge of the danger she is in is one of the key predictors of possibly lethal violence. Of course, nothing and not all matters end in lethal violence, but it's important to take into account um, that presentation if it does occur. But the complexities are that she could be fearful about, qu quite frankly, being homeless and out on the street. If she's been financially abused, um, she could be cut off quite easily from income and assets. Um, she could be concerned about her children and losing custody of her children, and that's not unknown to happen, or that he may be having access when he really has had little involvement in the child's life and he's actually, and the children are quite fearful of him. So those issues in relation to children, how am I going to get on? How do I live? And also that the violence can sometimes, the separation can make it become, it can be a trigger to even more dangerous violence after separation because he, as he starts to lose control of her through the separation, can start to engage in those um, really, really dangerous behaviours of stalking her and watching her and and trying to, to get her back, basically, um, and harassing and intimidating her as well. And I think that, you know, for many of our, our listeners, you know, this, some of that behaviour is what they see presented, you know, in the workplace, and it's particularly the stalking, you know, the, the multiple phone calls, the contacting the employer and, you know, telling them lies about, you know, a drug habit, for instance, or, or something along those lines, or, or, you know, simply her not being able to attend work because she's unable to leave the house. And, and unfortunately, you know, we, we heard a story from the SDA in our previous podcast that talked about, um, you know, the fact that, you know, one of their members was being prevented from obtaining food um, during their shifts and, and had no access to money and, and, and things like that. So, you know, it's so, I think, it, d domestic family violence happens in so many different forms. Certainly for our listeners, it's important for them to understand it might not just be something that, you know, they're even considering. As, as being the primary issue, but of course it's all very disturbing. So tell us a bit about how the law works when it comes to domestic and family violence. Obviously that's a really complex question because, you know, the family law is one thing, but, you know, if somebody comes to you and, and makes a disclosure, I mean, what's the best thing to do from that point? <laughs> I think it's really important for people to understand in the community and for employers who play and the workplaces play such a key role in responding to domestic violence because a key factor of domestic violence, what perpetrators will do is try to socially isolate victims from any kind of support that they can have. And so actually going to work can be a key support uh, for women. It can um, sustain their self-esteem. It can be a place where your self-esteem is being torn down at home, but you have a level of self-esteem still at work. And of course, you are um, also continuing to earn income, which is really, really important in relation to if, if you're ever going to be able to leave the um, domestic violence situation. I think it's really important to obviously respond sensitively to that disclosure. For somebody to actually make a disclosure is a big thing. They have to feel a level of trust um, in their workplace to do that. So obviously um, assuring them about their confidence, about that it will be kept confidential and that you will do what you can to, to support them. And also to remember that you don't have to be the expert, that it's about providing those referrals that, um, you know, it, it's making statements that um, you have a right to be safe, your children have a right to be safe. There are specialised services that exist in the community that can provide assistance and help. And I really encourage you to take up those referrals. Here is a list of referrals or here is a website that provides assistance. You can make those phone calls now. So kind of that, just that encouragement to, to, to know that services are out there to help. And it's really, I think, you know, encouraging them into a specialist domestic violence service or a specialist domestic violence legal service is, is really important. Once a woman 
or if a woman is seeking legal advice, she will often be um, one of the first things a lawyer will talk to her about is the issue of a domestic violence protection order, which is a civil order that can be obtained usually fairly quickly. Urgent orders can be obtained from a magistrate's court, which is a local court in the community, where a magistrate has to be uh, satisfied that a relevant relationship exists so that there has been an intimate um, personal relationship or there it's a family relationship or an informal care relationship that it has been an act of domestic violence and that it's the magistrate will also have to be satisfied that it's necessary and desirable to make the order. So basically what that protection order does is it doesn't punish for the past violence, but it's about protecting against future violence. So often it, it may be that a no contact order is made. In relation to employers, it's, it, it, it's you know, important to note that you can contain on that or involve on the um, domestic violence order workplaces and other places that the perpetrator may not attend. And if um, there is a breach or if that order is broken, then criminal prosecution can take place. But it's not about criminal prosecution, it's about stopping future violence. And children also can be um, included on those orders as well. Often, Clients will also require information in relation to family law processes, both in relation to how a property settlement would be determined, de be determined and also in relation to children. Um, so those, those are complex issues. It's best for victims of domestic violence to get very specialised domestic violence um, informed legal advice around all of those things and to get it as early as possible. So if possible, before they even separate, to actually know what the law, how the law will work um, and how the law can best, and they can be put in a position of um, getting the best protection they can from legal processes. And, and the thing that's really important for our listeners is that, you know, nobody wants them to be the experts in this um, area and that there are so many other people or other services that they can refer um, employees to if they find themselves in a position like this, particularly when it comes to things like family law and, and obviously um, obtaining an order. And, you know, for many employers, I mean, I, I'm sure they weren't aware that they can have their own workplaces included on those orders, which I think is quite essential in, in many situations. So I think that's really good advice. From your first-hand experience, what are some of the hardest parts about navigating the legal system if you're someone who is experiencing domestic and family violence? Look, there's a lot of barriers and a lot of issues in relation to the legal system and how responsive it is. And that's why we continue to work and advocate for change in the legal system to make it more responsive to victims of domestic violence. Look, there's huge issues in relation to, I mean, it's very scary for anyone to go to court. So for a victim of violence to be going to court with your perpetrator on the other side of the bar table, that in itself is quite intimidating. Um, but it might be necessary for, for their protection to get a protection order. So in itself, that scary, intimidating approach is really um, something in itself that can be a barrier. I mean, going to see a lawyer, many women have never engaged with lawyers before and this is maybe the first time. So going off and, and seeing a lawyer and talking to them can also be um, really, really scary. I mean, you're talking about things that you're probably ashamed about. Um, you're talking about things that are extremely private um, and you're talking about them with another person and may well be, you know, th those arguments are, are then going to be kind of running court and, it, you know, there's a lot of shame associated with that. It's uh, I mean, there's issues in relation to cost. There's a lot of costs associated with, you know, taking legal proceedings. And that is really scary for many people. And I think that there still is a bit of a disconnect in legal decision making and legal understanding. You can get some really, really good lawyers out there and you can get some really, really good magistrates and police officers. But then you can actually also get people that um, aren't as understanding. And so obviously, if that occurs and you have an interaction with that kind of person, it can really make it more 
difficult to continue if you have been disbelieved by an authority figure or you've been dismissed or, or what you've said um, hasn't been been given the serious, you know, the serious attention that it should. So these are the things that can happen. So that's why it's really important for victims of violence and for employers to refer women off to those specialist services as early as possible so that they can um, immediately get into getting having the best chance possible by getting the best advice so that they can um, make themselves as safe as possible through the process. And look, and those um, resources are available on the hub as well for anybody who's listening who might be thinking about where they're going to find them and they've all been compiled for you. Angela, what are some of the key factors that increase the likelihood of a person safely and successfully removing themselves from a violent situation? Really, I think it's those early referrals to specialist domestic violence services, specialist domestic violence legal services. It just increases the likelihood of, and early and early advice. So getting advice early around where to go and what to do. Those domestic violence services would put in place and would assist a woman through uh, safety planning and how to exit a relationship with herself and her children as safely as is possible. They are experts in relation to um, safety and uh, they understand domestic violence. It's their core business. So it, it's that ability to get into those specialist services early, get that expert advice to get you on the right path as early as possible. So, yeah, that would be my advice. And how important is financial independence in a scenario like this? Extremely important. What we know is that about 80 to 90 percent of women who seek assistance from domestic violence services have actually suffered financial abuse. It may not be at the forefront of what they speak about when they go to see a domestic violence um, worker or a domestic violence legal service, but it is the issue that can hold women back from leaving because they aren't financially secure. It can be the issue if they do leave and they are faced in a position of extreme poverty or homelessness or something else of that nature where they will return to the abuser if they don't have that financial independence. So it is absolutely essential for, for women to be able to continue to work through this process of leaving domestic violence or while they're in a domestic violence situation. And so the workplace and their, their response is absolutely absolutely critical to um, safe outcomes for women and children in this space. What sort of impact can a supportive employer have not only on the employee but also on the employee's friends, family and wider community? Well, every interaction that is supportive is another, it builds the confidence of the domestic violence survivor in relation to finding safety for herself and her children. And an employer is in a position of influence. They set a standard in the workplace for other employees to follow. It sends a message that, therefore, it sends a message to our community. Many employers are, you know, well regarded in the community, have a position on many things in the community. So if they have a very, uh, a very positive position on domestic violence prevention and supporting workers who have experienced domestic violence, that sends a message to the wider community that this is an important issue and, and that's important in relation to, it's really through wider community engagement that we're going to bring a change. It's not just from advocates or lawyers or something like that. It's everyone's, it's part of everyone's responsibility. And obviously employers are part of the community and have, have a position of influence that can be really important. 
And I think, you know, to start some of those conversations in your workplace, certainly the hub has a, a range of posters and, and communication tools that you can implement in your workplace as well, just to create a culture where it is safe to make disclosures and, and for your employees and everyone who attends to understand, you know, what is and what isn't acceptable within, you know, a, a domestic situation. I mean, Angela, what are some of the things that employers should never do when trying to support an employee? I suppose to try to influence the decision, like you, you've got to get out of there, you've got to leave, or to impose their own values on the situation, or to discredit her or question um, some of her decision making, or to be dismissive or tell other people in the workplace, I suppose, um, to, you know, that, that can create a lack of trust and, and confidence. Perhaps, a, you know, a d- dismissive attitude or that it's really not something that impacts on work, so why are you telling me this? Yeah, I suppose those kind of attitudes, which, you know, obviously exist in the broader community as well, but they can have a hugely detrimental impact if someone has built or believes that they are going to share with you something that for many for many um, women is is deeply shameful to then have that thrown back in their face or their decision making questioned could be highly detrimental and it and it then makes it more difficult for that woman to trust again and to actually disclose to anybody else and it's really important for her to try to reach out for assistance to obviously be able to get out and get out safely if that's what she wants to do and I think that I think that's just um, really important and, and good advice. Um, what are some of the most important things you know an employer can do other than obviously listening and, and having a compassionate response to a disclosure? Um, what are some of the other things that they can do during what could be a very difficult time if it is the first time someone's disclosed? <laughs> I think that you spoke or touched on that before, Dom. You've you've spoken about creating a culture of normalising this issue, and um, you know having posters, having policies around that talk about domestic violence issues. That obviously having their HR and their managers trained in these issues, um, and obviously being alert to some of the signs that could mean someone is struggling, and it might be that domestic violence sits behind that. So some, you know, kind questioning in relation to if someone is turning up late, if someone is wearing long sleeves in the summer, like their dresses, you know, they, they could be um, covering up something, you know, like bruises and things of this nature, constant harassment or phone calls to the office by the partner or ex-partner. And obviously it's just that kind of kind questioning around in a confidential space if, if that person is okay to see whether um, there's anything that can be done. And obviously if the disclosure comes, it's then talking to her also in relation to perhaps some safety planning at work and what can be done in relation to limiting his ability to use office equipment to harass coming to the office, what can be done around stopping that or how staff should react. Obviously, we don't want to also put employees in danger in any kind of way. So it's just around talking through what could make her safe. She may have to come in a different door or a different um, entrance way if things are that serious. So, yeah, I think that there's a range of things that can be done, yeah, to support. And how critical is privacy? I mean, especially in those initial, in that initial period, if she has decided to leave, I mean, how important is it that you know other employees don't disclose you know phone numbers or whereabouts or talk about her roster or when she's going to be in next? Well, it's critically important because it actually could save her life, and that's the the reality. We still have in Australia one woman a week is killed because of domestic violence because she's made a decision to leave the relationship. So anything that would give a clue to the perpetrator uh, about an imminent separation or that she has separated actually is highly dangerous 
for her. She could be in hiding. She could be in a women's refuge. And so it's absolutely um, critical for safety that that information is not released uh, to someone who, who may be seeking it for obviously ulterior purposes. Well, thank you, Angela. That has been um, very enlightening and, and very informative. And I think that, you know, our, our listeners would agree that, you know, certainly the Women's Legal Service in Queensland is absolutely experts in this area. And, you know, you're a great um, service that, you know, obviously accepts referrals. So if, you know, anyone in your workplace is having, you know, issues and there are children involved, please make sure you refer them to the Women's Legal Service in Queensland. So thank you for coming in today. Thanks, Dominique, for the opportunity. Thanks for listening. The Domestic Violence Retailer Support Hub is a project of the National Retail Association in conjunction with the Queensland Government. Catch up and contribute at www.dvretail.com.au.